Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to this reading. Hope you're all having a wonderful time so far. I'm, I'm going to make a quick announcement and then introduce Forrest Gander to you. My name is Char Nord. This year's festival is presented by the Downtown Brattleboro Alliance, and it's made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, Arch Capital, the Howitt Family Foundation, Tim Mayo, the Thompson Trust, the Vermont Humanities Council, Vermont Public Radio, and Bob and Ann Works. We would like to thank all our advertisers and encourage you to visit their stores. Born in California, Born in California's Mojave Desert, no less. Poet Forrest Gander grew up in Virginia and attended the College of William & Mary, where he majored in geology. After receiving an MA in literature from San Francisco State University, Gander moved to Mexico, then to Arkansas, where his poetry, informed by his knowledge of geology, turned its attention to landscape as foreground source of action. Gander's books of poetry inc include Ico and Como, Core Samples from the World, Eye Against Eye, Torn Awake, and Science and Steeple Flower. Though primarily a poet, Gander is also a translator, novelist, essayist, and editor of two anthologies. He's translated collections by Mexican poets Pura Lopez Colome and Coral Boncho. With Ken Johnson, he translated Bolivian poet Jamie Senza's Imminent Visitor and Night for which he won the Penn Translation Award. His translations of Neruda are included in the Essential Neruda Selected Poems. He's edited bilingual anthology Mouth to Mouth, poems by 12 contemporary Mexican women. Gander's own poetry has been translated into several languages. His novel, As a Friend, was published in 2008, and his new novel, The Trace, which he's also reading from this weekend, was published this year. Gander has received fellowships from the Guggenheim, Biting, Howard, and United States Artist Foundations, and is a recipient of the Witter Binner Library of Congress Award. Um, this book, um, Panicure, Poetry from Spain from the 21st Century, is just a fa fabulous and essential book that uh, translations of um, 21st American um, Spanish uh, poetry, which I encourage you also to take a close look at when you're looking at this various books back there. Forrest has traveled the world, listening, recording, translating both local and foreign voices and a kind of global project that belies any notion of a nationalistic conceit or aesthetic. He goes about this universal, universal business with a deep eye and piercing, a deep ear and piercing eye, discovering enlightening strangeness and difference in far-flung places as well as within his own literal borders. What's the news media, he writes in core samples from the world, don't want you to know about? With this tireless commitment to witnessing life elsewhere and here, Forrest has become a citizen of the world with his poetry as his passport. We've lived in a synchronic way for over 30 years now, but Forrest shows us time and time again that the cyber leviathan that has mesmerized us with more mind-numbing information than important reminders of our human history has diminished us to citizens and denizens of a wounded planet. Forrest wakes us with poems that are at once operatic and hieratic. Whether he's writing about the erotic Japanese dancers, Aiko and Como, translating the poems of the Mexican poet Pura Lopez Colome, reporting on a rewarding, a rewilding community, very rewarding as well, in the purlieus of Virginia, recording eloquent journal entries from his travels to China, Mexico, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Chile, taking stock of environmental damage, compiling photographs to accompany poems and essays for his own version of Haven. Forrest is witnessing the main things of our age unflinchingly objectively, exquisitely, curiously. He has taken, Betrol, um, he's taken Bertrand Brecht's metaphysical insight and advice to heart. Two souls abide within one breast. Keep the one, keep the other. 
to abide with both is best. Forrest Gant. That's the always equanimous and casually, but also profoundly thoughtful shard in your. <clears throat> I'm happy to be reading with Eliza here, um, and, <clears throat> and throw me back up here in Vermont. I'm going to read a couple of new things, <clears throat> and keep track of the time. I'll read for just 20 minutes, 20, 23 minutes, 17. So it's 117 now. What's 20 minutes later? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> what is it? 37. Thank you. That's right. That's 20. So I'll give you him. 37. <clears throat> the one shuffling cards, you, enveloped by the sound of cards being shuffled. Your shadow is shuffled into six shadows at once, and the lights repositioned as part of an elaborate surveillance, like ravens with their feet and beaks tied hung upside down, peering at you in some overlit underworld. The movement of your face and arms and the eyes and hands of others around the table are like a commotion of birches. The one hiding a card, you, doesn't see the other card hidden like a shadow in the shadow below the six of clubs, face up in the hand that someone spread out across the table when he heard the call come from a collect of shadows. Was that you or a forest of birds calling? Um, this isn't entirely new, but I'm still working on it. And uh, um, a poet sent me a, a rock from Colorado. Um, that was used by Native Americans to grind um, meal and, um, and grain, um, which is called a mano and the Maldina. So um, holding this rock that had been held by others um, you know, 800 years ago uh, made me imagine the sort of human relationship to, uh, to that landscape that it comes out of and to the traces of the human in, in the rock. Mano. In microscopic pots of a palm-sized granite stone, traces of green corn, purslane, snake fat, and pinion fuse with smeared roots and beeweed pollen, ochre dust, which drifts summer long into the scalp of a woman kneeling, intent, and bent over a light-bitten stone basin her muscles flexed, trapezius to triceps, the wrist thick, working a short orbital swipe, hand stone taking the curve of palm, cupped, and her torso's weight falling through, while swallows dive and veer along the sheer cliff, the warm, scabbed heel of her palm bears down, heel of palm, onto and into the skirling sound. Stone merged with the hand that grinds it wheel-wise, the maker breath blown, alive in her tool, lithe, flies fussing and landing, her hair fallen across her eyes, radiant upbeat, leaf trilled, and into this cadence is inset the slower cadence to which she rocks her baby when he cries, and all the variable tempos of her breath, her body's measure, countless breaths decibels of fullness, day's utterance, and stress, all this pressed against basalt, vesicles into the stone, into the pot stone, goes a rabbit hair, brushed from the hand that flinched the hide in late eye-long afternoon, when red ants pour from holes in the rocky soil, ticking across fluff grass, square-headed ants, toward a garden, where three guardian turkeys peck them, the leaf-eating ants. A minor victory, the garden greens up, registering in the eyes of the woman who scuffs stone on stone in the flood-buckling blare of violence and time that pockets her light in our, our light 
as the pupil narrows in its lens and we bend, kneel almost, in a clearing to pick up and weigh the rock, hawk glide, our hand where millenniums gone her hand had been, who winks out when we come clear, to whom, on a weedy hillside where someone kneels, in the now, even now, beyond our still flow, looking. lifeless in chair facing TV, whole days mute, her own mind, her hearing shot, and it won't get any better, absolutely nothing to look forward to, she says, to you. Wearing two identical left shoes, no one believes I don't dye my hair, she announces for the umpteenth time. Point taken, I'm grayer than my mother, though in the mirror I see her face, her small, dark eyes. 451 miles north, he imagines what could be causing that odd sound behind his mother's voice. She's gone down on the floor, taking the phone in one hand, and with the other, she must be scratching the tumorous dog whose paw convulsively breaks the carpet. Green case on the nightstand, glasses on a redskin's lanyard, green glasses case containing one hearing aid, minus its battery on the nightstand, glasses on a redskin's lanyard, in the green grass, under one of many bird feeders, in the backyard, thronging with blurred, mute birds. Occasional mucuscan chortling or choking and steady beep of the EKG. The beak hard determination to be a good person. What happened to that? How is it true that I have to go now? For her, the occasion of my presence begs for more. Who is my mother now I am unspoken for? And take my mother's hand walking in her garden an animal moment of warmth she won't remember after we sit. Voracious starlings ride a swinging cage of suet. That signal enthusiasm in her eyes muddles with torment. Choose whatever you will and the disease still wins. Mm -hmm. Like a dark shawl, the shadow of a cloud drags across mountains on the horizon. But maybe I've misread her expression. find the present breaking itself loose from the sequence of events, bolting through gaps in the corral of context and carrying its befuddled rider into an expanding plane of blurry outlines. To listen to each repetition with renewed attentiveness as if it were the first occasion to forget you've heard it before, and to receive her words as her first words or her last ones. For she repeats things not only because she's forgotten, but also so they will be remembered. Mm. To come into a rhythm of farewell with her, marking it, relishing its periodicity, in order to crack open another kind of love inside the old, familiar love, a vast of acceptance without condition, akin to what a mother might feel for her child, or the reverse. Hmm. 
And then um, <coughs> Shard mentioned a, um, a, a series of poems that I did, a little book called Echo and Coma. Is, um, is my time? Is it time? Great. No, okay, it's, so yeah, it's fine. We're good. I'll finish with this. <coughs> So this, these are two dancers. Anybody seen them dance? Yeah, going, ah, great! Wow, that's fantastic. That's a high percentage up here. Um, so um, lots of people in New York have seen them in, in Boston. Uh, and and uh, so there are a couple who have danced together for close to um, 40, 30, 30 some years. And uh, they're the only couple to, to get a uh, MacArthur grant together. They, um, they were trained in sort of uh, Japanese buto, which is this sort of post-war um, dance that was influenced by French avant-garde. And, um, and then they developed it into something different. They all, um, almost always performed, well, for, for 25 years, performed nude um, in um, sort of caked with, uh, with rice powder. Um, and they move incredibly slowly um, and in configurations that make the body look like something you've never seen before. And um, so um, this is a, a buried sestina um, called Buried for them. Unpacks the recognizable its chaos here and the composition stutters. Face stalking itself from inside, beyond all levels of, compressed into looking, unplotted, brutal, a dust, his back muscles, her rib cage splays, they are naked, filled with the enormity of naked stillness, head held up, her hair pierced, quills fixed to her back, and her right knee bent to her face, the air muffled through which his looking flies from somnolent eyes beyond walls that mark another beyond of rooms echoey with shoe scuffs, naked squeaks, fully stretched. He looks up, bows his neck, his hair pouring to the floor as his face lifts, chin tilting backwards toward the audience seated back from the stage on benches in a beyond dim out from which they face the mound of ordure with naked bodies on either side, blue-black hair, soft as a negative of two match flames. Look at the splice of likeness, then look again. It is severed. They turn their backs as water drops pop here and here across the dirt and beyond in dim penetralia, naked sound of water drops in the quiet. Her face fissures, her mouth a rictus, her face in its final expression, an unsustainable look into another dimension. Of what? His naked hand, a piece of music, boosted into the black as we, in curved light beyond ourselves, reach for his fingers, reaching for her hair, two larval bodies, naked with faces, and seared straw in their hair, hold our looking to the dark back of and beyond. So I think um, I'll, I'll finish there. They uh, they they danced yeah naked until their kids were in high school and <laughs> and their kids finally you know said mom dad come on we're in New York City you know <clears throat> my friends are going to see this stuff and then they they started doing elaborate costumes. Thanks very much. <laughs>
Miracle, Arrhythmia, The Requited Distance, and a chapbook, Memoria, Memoria. Her collection, Mule and Pear, was selected for the 2012 inaugural Poetry Award by the Black Caucus American Library Association. <laughs> and she has been a member of the Comic Conum Collective since 2006. Her visual and literary work has been widely published in journals including APR and Callaloo, the Indiana Review, Crab Orchard Review, Rattle, and many, many other publications. And she teaches creative writing at Sarah Lawrence College and lives in New York. Rereading Rachel Eliza Griffith's poems during the last week has been an incredible gift to me, um, an opportunity to swim in the lakes and ponds and rivers and seas of poetry. She is part of a long continuum of poets, many of whom she refers to and incorporates mm. in the poems of her new collection, which is truly an extraordinary, extraordinary book, um, Lighting the Shadows. Um, I almost didn't get here. I could not stop reading it <laughs> over and over again. Um, I had to pause from time to time because my heart was beating so fast <laughs> as I was reading it. In the continuum that Rachel Eliza Griffiths is a part of, is Muriel Rookheiser and Lucille Clifton, her great grandmothers of poetry, and Paul Ceylon Rilke T.S. Eliot. And she is part of a continuum of visual artists who she writes about as well, Frida Kahlo, for instance. I was fortunate to meet Rachel Eliza through a tribute honoring Muriel Rookheiser and uh, her centenary. How Muriel would rejoice <laughs> in lighting the shadow. Uh, the reaching and the searching and the expansive poems, her truth telling and the retelling of myth, Icarus's sister, uh, the emotional calling, the political awareness that is expressed through the art of poetry, not for the sake of political statement, but as an expression of deep humanity, bearing witness in the music of poems. Rukhaiser said in The Life of Poetry, the use of truth is its communication. In Rachel Eliza Griffith's journey through love, through grief, witness, suffering, through the connection of the spirits of the artists and poets that guide her and teach her and keep her company, she arrives at an acceptance of self in this new collection, in the last stanza of the last poem. She has walked through Adrian Rich's door, feral and flattened by grief, telling of the sister of Icarus, returning to herself like a room. I greatly look forward to what she will offer us all next, and we are so fortunate to hear her today as part of the Global Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've, been, I've been enjoying myself since Thursday when I got to spend some time with students at Landmark College. And I'm grateful to be here with all of you as, as, a, as a poet, but also as a reader. And I am beyond delighted to be here with Forrest and reading um, with him. Um, I love his translations mm -hmm. um, and his poems and his novel. His new one is really good. I too am going to keep to a 20 minute time. 
So I'd like to begin with the first poem in the collection, Lighting the Shadow, which is The Dead Will Lead You. Um, many of the openings, the doors or windows in this um, book uh, arrive through photographs or paintings or the lives of artists. And so in the first poem, uh, several years ago, uh, the world was kind of looking for evidence that biological terrorism was happening in Syria. And so I came across a photograph of a child kind of jumping between rows of children who were shrouded in white who had been killed. And so this child is kind of playing this, this living child is playing a game. So the poem begins there, and then of course as poems do, it, it has its own say. The dead will lead you. The dead will lead you across scarred meadows Red, blue, white. The star-flung sky scrapes gold grass. Unknown milk. Endless the stone figures in the fields. Who will embalm our bones? Shattered inside of mythologies, we are idols praised by blood and sun. You will call and listen for the children cradled in moonlight, side by side, their silence deranged, deflowered by ghost primers. Years pulse the skull, the ashen hills, the expanse of desert shorn with prayers. You walk alone through mirages, museums, eyelids, water, estuaries, where wings repeat flight until this desire is memorized. This is what you must learn by heart. The closed flesh as commandment. A terracotta smear of fingerprints praying along the blue cave. Mercy is the pulse of lupin in a yellow field. My mother's eyes of forgotten vases of irises. Lighting the shadow, a woman crawls out beneath her own war. Ruin, I have lived inside your estate. I remember the night horses, reckless with my beauty, when the trembling poured through my windows. The animals surrounded my bed as we floated through the house, the world without sail, anchor, ornament, or oar. My memory was a painted mast filled with the inviolate breath of what history can blow apart. Small prayer to the God of Epiphany. You heard me ask not to be harmed, as if you could or could not be harm itself, undressing that old speech. And so you were the waters, pulling dead weight up. Broken words could float if breath was complicit. You, want, you wanted me to unhinge, finger by finger, the place where I held to rock. Leaping from the cliff wasn't as interesting as holding the weight of flesh in winter air. We try to establish what infinity is, what eternity means. It means there is a distinct forever that can be calculated never to arrive. I lifted my hands in the night. Earlier, I was here um, listening to a gorgeous reading um, with uh, Vijay, and he said that his book couldn't, couldn't be dark. It was a dark book, and it mm -hmm. made me chuckle because I, I, I have a shadow book, and so, so now there's shadow everywhere on a pretty overcast day. So if I think of a good joke, I'll try to, <laughs> but I likely will. This poem is called The Reckoning of Relics, and um, 
as a tiny narrative, I spent a month in Austerlitz, New York, at the Malay colony, which is called Steepletop. And I got one of these, I'm constantly in, interested in kind of the residue of writers, particularly objects and kind of their like stuff. And so um, I got a tour of Malay's house and um, we were in her bedroom <coughs> and um, the, the, the man who was giving the tour, you know, was showing me these like fabulous clothes and just different things of hers. And then um, he surprised me, he put out a manila envelope and just like, well, you know, wait, wait for it. And I'm like, what is this? Um, and it was her hair, and it, you could still see the red. She had this like, gorgeous, like, kind of red gold burning kind of hair that um, was amazing, and you could kind of see this 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 lingering fire. So you'll hear me say his name, which is Peter, um, and you'll hear me say another poet's name, a sister poet, Tracy. And I think that's it. The reckoning of relics. This is the gristle of imagery, the need to see what is past. Not history, not the before or long ago, but the saint's finger, the sarcophagus of imagery, the immortal <laughs> phrases of headstones. Somewhere after death, a detail remains, sits in the mind, brightly impenetrable as a mineral, lapis lazuli, diamond. It was June in Austerlitz and I was circling the stalls of my life, flinging kerosene over what I'd done wrong. The stars slid over hummingbirds in the evening. Deer neared me, then turned away in the meadow's lumina. Beneath apple trees, I sat and rubbed my hands across the bark of my own skin and the red compass within my ribcage. One afternoon, Peter walked me through Malay's house, asked me to imagine the house, the woman's work, her mass. I was staying in the barn, invisible from the writer's windows taking a month to heal the broken flames of my phoenix, the better woman prepared for flight. I walked for hours, miles, became a vapor, returned from ash, wrote to Tracy, climbed trees, met black snakes and barred owls, breathed like a firefly. Alone, a frame of light in a museum, without a painting inside, without a self-portrait. In the morning, high grass floated beneath dew, and I listened to my new flesh, the truer poem. The listening saved me, even when my ears bled and my heart leaked. I stood at the window in my head and looked out at the loping black bear, the pinions of black crows, the thickets of youth flattening beneath my whispers. Upstairs, Peter held his palm out to me, the hush and eternity of a dead woman's curls, baited with threads of red. is called Elegy and begins as an epigraph um, from Lorca, who's one of my favorite poets. Um, and this is Lorca's. Cut my shadow from me, free me from the torment of seeing myself without fruit. Elegy. The night has let go of me now and touches the barren grave where my shovel works. These poems our stony beds, inscribed imperfectly. They are also loaves and lovers. Their cradles starve, and I wander across the god-flecked bridge between night valleys. 
The meadows and the old country are sawdust. The moon douses my hair and peels my breast. The sun forgets me, leaves no gold treasure on my hips. Memory is a burnt child I carry on my back. All of the hours refuse to stay longer when the last glass of Bordeaux runs out of the house clutching its belt. My secrets have chapped lips. Once I gave them honey, blood, and language. I never inquired of their subtle pain. Why should I want their torment? Why do I believe in fools? Now I see gardens wherever roots were pulled up. A smile of quiet wheat thrives in the ash of mud, a seed shaped like youth blown backwards. I close the gate and switch on every light my flesh has needed. Even the tongue in my mouth, diluted by farewell, shines with the love of letting go. So the next poem I'd like to read is, is another ekphrastic poem, um, and it takes its window or its frame. Um, there's a photograph by the photographer Nicholas Marai, who was a lover of Frida Kahlo's, and um, some of you, many of you are, are likely familiar with this image where um, Kahlo is in traction, and so she's this kind of onion-shaped gauze that's you know lifting her face up, and it's a photograph, um, and uh, Marai took this photograph of her. And as I was, as I was working on this book, um, I started to really investigate actual photographs of Kahlo as opposed to her own paintings, her own work, and um, ended up going down to Koya Ken for uh, numerous trips because I've been really projecting on her in the way that we continue to kind of project on her and Basquiat. There's certain artists who kind of stay present, and I'm very fascinated by that. And so I had to kind of go to her kitchen and meet her on her own turf and kind of listen that way, as opposed to the ways I had been trying to access her. Um, if you are in New York and you can go to the New York Botanical Garden, um, I curated the Poetry Walk, which features the work of Octavio Paz, one of my favorite poets. Um, and so they actually have a small gallery that has some of Kahlo's sketches and watercolors um, and a, and a self-portrait of hers. Um, and then they kind of recreated parts of Casa Azul, kind of the, the gardens, the cacti, the flowering, um, which she and her father and, and her family um, really cultivated there. And so um, there's an epigram for this poem, which is uh, W.S. Merwin, and it's this. The lightning has shown me the scars of the future. Self-traction. They pull the woman up in her bed. New bandages clasp her face in white. They pull her legs down because she is trying to fly. Beneath wounds, you will find water, skin, lust, longing. These are strokes of faith. They pull the woman up in her bed. Moonlight seduces the bodies flaring in her eyes. They pull her legs down, then pull her dress away to shame her thorns. Pull God out of the folds of her skin. They do not let her thoughts peel her head. Her tears sculpt a world. They pull the woman up in their bed. She has been moved to her grave to make them feel more comfortable. Beneath the gauze, her breast flutter, stuffed with starlings in the ecstasy of cobalt pigment. She is a cardinal lost in the hive of language. Her song has no pain, but offers mercy anyway. They place a stone beneath her teeth, dare her to bear down on black roots in shatter. In agony and gold leaf, she laughs. They push the body to the edge of the bed to study their incisions. 
It is a wick, the body they want to drag through fire, effigy. They pull the woman up in her bed, not liking her sounds because she is free. A mind is a socket in lightning when it flies, I said. They pull the light out of her skin, pull the lilac out of her skull, pull the poems wet and writhing out of her, wringing her body in opposite directions until this line is perfectly straight. Thirty-three ages for solitude. Are you the kind of music that claims life and death? Never anonymous, are you the square of rain or light? Are you the casket or the bed? Are you the maybe and the maybe not? Are you the word I uttered in the dark, in the dark where you had no border? Oh, Lord, will you ever leave the dark? Will you ever tire of your invention? Oh, lightness, the sea and creatures who tread the earth. The music I heard when I knelt down in the middle of a dream and begged to stay a dream forever. Speak to me sometimes in your voices of gray. Write the world as a clear chord in this body you blew from mud. Are you the kind of joy that is long? Say that some infinity ago I knew sweetness before I tore it away. Are you, Tooth, pulling my stray music into your cavity of granite? Say it harder, what I have said to death once. I loved you. Let me be a silent sky above you now. Let me be a 33-year-old bowstring, a tooth, the oaks work song, a time and root promised to end. How am I? How am I a time? Like a few more? I select my jury before justice appears. You made things up, how you felt, who you were. Beyond the cities and the caves, you sent me to look for your body. You hid yourself, disguised your taste, your voice. In our mouths, you planted longing and hunger. We walk around repeating your hands, we can say who is wrong and who is nothing. We polish the sidewalks with our forgetting, play the lotto, bum noise from the dead, turn our mothers and fathers into stone. We won't abandon the orphans of history or the worship of their shivering. We lift our work horses and smear our senses with dogma. You made things up how we felt, and now emptiness is the feeling we trust best. We walk around mourning our germs, you unmade the houses we tended, the unfinished children, the lonely flat TV. There was a chance to shatter. The detour of loving, then dying, too devastating to follow. The gavel, the injury of a cross, and we look up to what? The alchemy of perpetual discontent. To ask for what? And then I'm just going to end with two um, new poems. Um, I'm going to end with two new poems and gratitude. 
How's everyone doing? Good? So I, I, I was listening so closely. Um, thank you, Faris, for the poems you read about your mother. Um, I'm going to read two poems about my mother, and it's so interesting. Not interesting, it's so inadequate. There's another word beyond interesting that, thank you. Um, what I can say about this poem, it's called University of Mississippi 2015, and I've been down in Oxford, Mississippi for a photography project I'm working on, and um, realized that my mother was dying, and so the day I left Oxford, she, she died the next day in Philadelphia, and so I think that's all I can tell you, and this happened last year. When they say she can no longer speak, the blackbirds in the Oxford Cemetery arrive, silent on Faulkner's wires, each consonant of midnight opening a pall of wings against stones where the dead too perch. The appalling bones who have climbed up from the long music of my eyes. Birds fly with no meaning but return. Who is looking back at my face? Who will leave her blood tomorrow for the sun to rust the southern sky in sorrow? The entire month there were storms, beautiful enough to fear. Who told the oaks I was once a woman, a fear, a song? Who gave me sweet sapling to my mother in December, 35 years ago, who struck me, my skin as proof? In twilight, a doe and fawn cross the dead. In hunger, the animals nudge the stones they know by smell. In my dreams, their hunger is a mouth praying for the salt upon my palms. Did I cry? I once asked my mother, did I make a sound on my own? Or did you wait for them to hit me? I devour the cries of my birth today. They have returned with the news. The woman I knew, me, myself, the eldest daughter, has been left for death and birth at the edge of a void where words are sons I eat like Kronos. In the meadow of dying, I kneel and spin in the unholy water of love's drowning, nearly musical. Each sob cost an angel nothing. Each god tells death to look back at my face. Look at it, the gods say. She is not a woman that can last as these trees or blackbirds. She is no bride, no stone, no goddess. Here in Mississippi, I see and heed every rope Honey, cinder, you know it means the oaks are singing into the dreams of grief broken prisoners. The moonlight struck my skin last night for proof I had been born at all. My shadow given away chastely by my shadow. A kiss stolen beneath, between the earth and underworld. She cannot speak, a nurse says to me on the phone. She cannot tell you anything. Good death. Of words placed in their best black clothes, of that darkness full, of her laugh forged of dust that spilled its gold light into the tomb of the wreath carved upon her copper vault, of the ivory city bones like trumpets blowing you away from us in song, of the city again where you will be welcomed by vultures, of the road between your dates, a short slash, an usher in a gold hat, 
of the pronunciation of sorrow always for me now in summer, of the snake who suffered the story of innocence, of your afterlife and my downpour of ordinary rights, of rights I enact in my broken thoughts, of my fever waving its anguish until the match goes out in disbelief, of the nine stars bleeding mercy in Charleston beneath the roof of God, of God, God, and God, of the peace and suffering my people have been promised, of the clean white clothes I gave the undertaker, here are the stockings, I said, not knowing whether they would match her skin, of the poems I've been trying to write, die, I say, go elsewhere for songs, of the food and the appetite of my father's shoulders in a black suit of downpour again, of the animals who charge me with horns when I offer my pentameter of ribs, of her visitations, of her hot comb I cradled on my knees in the bathroom, of the brutal gospel of hair, untouched toothbrush, clothes in closets with sales tags, of dreams where my teeth scatter like maple leaves, of what I will never remember, of the rain that makes my howls float like empty bottles of glass, of the dreams where my white clothes grow flames, of what I will remember remembering, of the neon colored nail polish on her hand I held at her deathbed, it was summer, of what I hated to ask the night and gods, of my knees that remember the orange mud before the grass grew back, of you, reader, looking at my face here and reading me because we all want to know how to bear this. Of the strange, caring question, their voices poured like grace over my side where I was trying to get out of skin. Of it being over again and again, of it beginning, they ask me, was it a good death? Was it a good death. Was there peace for all of us? Why should I want peace instead of my mother? Of the mothers who have always known while holding children in their wombs? Why wasn't I told? Now I walk into the sea with my jewel of anguish and shake these human flowers from my new bald skull. Thank you. Thank you. 